headphones off. Mm. Power off. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Jonathan Segel, and I'm part of a band called Camper Van Beethoven. Uh, have been for most of my life now, in some weird way or another. And uh, I've also been, of course, making my own music for the last 25 years, and I'm going to play some of those songs here at Wolfgang's Vault. We're in the living room area of Wolfgang's Vault. Um, see the lava lamps over there. The Ted Nugent uh, pinball machine is behind me, which is a little intimidating. Have Ted Nugent with a shotgun behind you. Um, kiss statuettes. I'm going to play a few songs acoustically. This song uh, I'm going to start off with is called Lifeboat, and it's from a record I made in 2003 called Edgy Not Antsy. A renaissance of drunkenness A portrait suicide In the city full of the heat of food and sex Aren't you happy how you lied? He's locked out of his own head Sun is ringing loud today Heads full of shadows, no matter how loud it rings Sun can't drive them all away of drunkenness a portrait suicide in the city full of the heat of food and sex aren't you happy how you lied thanks um, this next song I'm gonna play is which one should I play how about Enough Air? This is from a record called Honey, which came out a couple years ago. Uh, mostly an electric record, very little acoustic guitar, but I think that it can translate well. Let's try it. An empty room, chill in the air. There are a few clues showing who is in there. All of those spots worn out by my stare. Salt crystals from dried tears spice my meals They've been gathered for years as if everything is as it appears I feel like I'm waiting, limbo never ends Time is abating, it's dulling my sense But it doesn't alleviate the suspense Breathe a cold breath, blow it on out Waiting for you to come and end this drought But I'm still without I can still remember the day that you left Torn from my side, we were cleft So I wait to stop being bereft I feel like I'm waiting, limbo never ends Time is abating, it's dulling my sense But it doesn't 
alleviate the suspense Ghosts in my home But nobody's there There is no sign Well, there's no mail in the box Not even a card The phone doesn't ring There's not even a sound No one knocks on the door And I know that it's you not coming home So I'm still alone song from the Honey CD. This one is called Can't Help It. I'll bend the physical laws of time and space get back to you Layers of light will fall away from your face when I'm with you I see the world shine in your eyes I guess that comes as no surprise I can't help it Get back to you I hardly know where you end and I begin when I'm with you oh, yeah. Every new flavor finds its place You are that special seventh taste You can't help it Break the physical laws of space and time Get back to you New universes form in the corners of my mind When I'm with you Oh yeah You know the secret, but I do too It makes us do that dance we do We can't help it This girl, Susanna Stein, I was really into her, and she played Pop Goes the Weasel at our, some break at school, and, and she plucked the string for the pop. And I was like, what a cool instrument. So, and now she is a, a symphony player in New York. Oh, fancy. Yeah, I know. So She's it's something good. you just always knew that you would be yeah, doing this. Yeah, I remember drawing also draw, like, drawing little pictures of like 
sort of like Cousin It, you know, just only hair with an uh, electric guitar and top hat and fat wings or whatever, like when I was little. Yeah, you should put those on eBay. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, right. We'll be all over that. So, yeah, I just, it was just, I just played music the whole time. Mm-hmm. When I went to college at Santa Cruz, um, I was studying music, uh, composition, actually. I was actually, at that point, doing mostly chamber music and, you know, mm-hmm. orchestra music and stuff like that. And it wasn't, I, I didn't get back into the rock music um, in college after sort of abandoning it after high school for a little while until I started playing with Camper Van Beethoven. Yeah, well, Camper is, you know, one of your, probably your most well-known band. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, you helped pioneer the underground radio, rock radio scene of the 90s with that band. Can you speak to some of the early days of formation? And- well, we formed in Santa Cruz in, well, actually, okay, the band had initially, David Lowry and Victor and Chris Mola, Victor Kumanaka and Chris Mola, had actually been in the band in Southern California on summer breaks for, between college and uh, between semesters of college in 81, 82, I guess. And uh, I didn't actually start playing with them until 1983 in Santa Cruz when they were back at college there. Mm -hmm. Um, But by the time we started playing in San Francisco in like 84, I guess, um, it was pretty much the punk rock scene. We were playing at, um, I think it was the Viz Club before it was the Kennel Club, before it was the Independent. No, Mm -hmm. before it was Justice League, before it was the Independent. And uh, the graffiti which is now Amnesia and places like this mm-hmm. and Nightbreak on Haight Street. So we were playing a lot of like sort of rock and punk rock venues and, uh, you know, we're coming up from Santa Cruz and people are like, what the hell? What's this underground stuff? What is this <laughs> stuff? Yeah. So That's that was, uh, and that was fun, you know, and we didn't make our first record until 1985. Okay. Came out in June of 85 on Savage Republic's label, uh, Independent Project. And then we hooked up with Rough Trade, who was over here on 6th Street at the time and, um, and started our own label, Pitch a Tent Records, and started putting out not only our records through Rough Trade, but also many other bands like Donner Party, uh, which mm-hmm. had Sam Coombs, who's now in Quasi, mm-hmm. and um, Spot 1019, and some other wrestling worms. My first solo record, Monks of Doom, bands like that. Cool. So, yeah. Um, you've been involved with you know, a number of bands, as well as been involved in many like solo endeavors. Yeah. How can you kind of speak to your creative energy and the difference between kind of relating to a band at the time and also being on your own. Yeah, it's definitely a, it's definitely a different thing. I mean, in Camper, um, I mostly play violin. Uh, I do some keyboards and some guitar. But we have David Lowry, who's able to strum and sing like a demon. So I don't need to do that in that band. Mm-hmm. And Greg Leiser, who plays lead guitar like nobody else. And so I basically get to fulfill a sort of color role. I think more in that band, and that's fun. But it also, um, it, having done that for now 27 years or something like that, I, I sort of know what it is that I need to do to be a band leader, and it's quite different than being that role. Um, you know, strumming and singing, if you're the focal point of a song, is definitely a different role. Um, when I played in Sparkle Horse, it was similar. Like Mark uh, Linkus sang and strummed the guitar, and I had a little ring of things around me. I had a keyboard and a glockenspiel, an electric guitar and a violin, and so I would basically be everything that wasn't the guitar and wasn't the rhythm section was what I did mm-hmm. in that band. <laughs> and I think when I first started fronting my own band back in like 1989, it was a little odd because I wasn't used to uh, having everybody uh, uh, rely on the front man to make sure that it was... Uh, to drive it. <laughs> yeah, to drive it, but also to make sure that like you were confident enough to say, yeah, you guys should be uh, you know, backing me up here, sort of thing. So that's an, it's an interesting situation to be in. Right. You, know, you have to build yourself up a little bit of confidence to be able to do that, definitely. How do you feel, um, you got your master's in music composition from yes. Mills. Yeah. How do you feel like after you, achieved, you got that in academia, how do you feel like you're, that have changed your approach to creating music? Um, I've definitely gone back and forth in, in different styles of music. I, l- I listen to a lot of different kinds of music. Um, when I went back to get my master's degree, I was in a weird uh, musical he- headspace, I think, because um, I had been playing on my own for a while, my own rock bands, and I produced a record by Clyde Wren um, and played with his band for a little while, and then had played with Sparkle Horse, which was you know, funded by EMI Capital. And when I was out of Sparkle Horse in 1999, my only real musical endeavors were, um, I made this record, that record, uh, Scissors and Paper, the red one mm-hmm. that's sitting over there. And after playing in Sparkle Horse, where the peer group, the people that we'd been hanging around with were like 
Polly Harvey and Radiohead and people like that, I felt uh, pretty bad about my own stuff. Like, uh, gosh, this is really not as good as what those guys are doing. So it took me a long time to finish that record. Okay. And, I, and I, at the time, was uh, scoring some films. Um, I did a film called The Invisibles, which was at Sundance in 1999, and I'm sure straight cool. to, you know... Uh, blockbuster video or whatever. Nationwide theater yeah, release. Yeah, never got nationwide theater <laughs> release. And some other ones and stuff like that. And I had sort of, I was sort of uh, unsure, I think, about what I wanted to do creatively on my own. Mm -hmm. So when I went back to school to study composition, it was one of those situations where it was like, you have the entire history of music behind you. You can do anything. The the horizon is incredibly incredibly vast. There is there are no limits. So it was, it was very difficult to figure out. It's daunting. Out. Yeah. It's daunting. Yeah. To figure out what to do. And so I got uh, I got sort of back into uh, the avant garde heavily and improvisation heavily. Mm -hmm. And I had been sort of schooled in in uh, the avant garde improvisation world by playing with Eugene Chadbourne for a long time in the eighties and early nineties. And again again at the uh, end of the nineties. So. Um, at Mills at the time, Fred Frith was uh, and is still one of the composition teachers there. So I was his assistant for the contemporary performance ensemble for the, the years that I was there. It's and, a great education. Yeah, it was, and that was a great education. And Joao Leandro was uh, teaching there, and she's an amazing improviser. Alvin Curran was there, Pauline Oliveros, all of these people who are amazing, not only composers, but improvisers. So I, I really heavily got into that. Also, Chris Brown uh, was teaching electronic music there, and I got very much back into doing electronic music. So I spent a lot of the early part of this last decade doing a lot of sort of improv and electronic music mm -hmm. as well. You're still, you know, pretty lyrically minded. Where do you find some of your lyric inspiration? Because they're very beautiful. Like, you know, they kind of range. Uh, yeah. A um, lot of different themes. And it, it's a very interesting question because, um, like, for instance, I've been playing with Camper, like I said, for a million years. And David Lowry is a very character driven writer. Mm -hmm. And I have always gone back and forth on this idea of being a character driven writer because I feel like... Um, he has said that there's no way that uh, an individual human's personal experience can fill 10 records, but I disagree with that. I feel like any one human's experience of love can develop the poetry to fill a million records. Mm -hmm. And and so I have always written per, from personal experience. I think Victor Krumenacher also, who's uh, from Camper and has been making his own records for uh, almost 20 years now also, uh, is has gotten into the character development. And I think that this is very common in, in writers uh, early on, I think uh, songwriters start from personal experience, and then when they sort of get a level of craftsmanship behind them, they switch over a lot of times to character-driven. Like novelists. Like yeah. novelists, right? And like I would say, like look at Richard Thompson's career as a, mm -hmm. as a songwriter. He's an amazing songwriter. Still is an amazing songwriter, but there's no way that he's specifically drawing from personal experience now. Right. Very um, prolific. He has a huge catalog. So I only rely on character-driven lyricism. Occasionally, when it uh, and a lot of times I'll try I'll try desperately to draw something from personal experience. Um, if I can't, then there are books. Like for instance, uh, uh, right now I'm I was just reading a book um, over the past couple of weeks by uh, Per Olaf Lindqvist, who's or Enqvist, who's a um, a Swedish author who wrote a book about the Danish king in 1760 and his personal physician. And there were some particular lines in it that I thought where the physician was describing the king that I thought were poignant and beautiful. And I've sort of lifted some of the imagery from that, and I'm trying to develop a song about that. Oh, that's great. Yeah. But that, other than that, it's like, I don't know. I don't know where they come from. How do you feel like living in the Bay Area informs your sound? Um, I'm definitely a Bay Area person. Um, I, I'm definitely a, a San Franciscan. I live in Oakland now. Um, I lived in San Francisco for a decade. I, I really love San Francisco. Um, Informs my sound. There's a, there's definitely a heritage of, of uh, this sort of this sort of uh, <laughs> jackhammer influence. Right. Sound. There's definitely a heritage of psychedelia that I'm definitely involved in. Yeah. There's definitely a heritage of, of blues rock and uh, you know and and the underground scene and uh, the underground scene that's sort of outside of the dogma of say when punk rock bands were here. Uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, they were a little bit outside of the dogma of punk rock as it developed in L.A., for instance. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to be Black Flag. You could be uh, Tuxedo Moon or The Avengers or something like that. You could be something different. And that's nice. I, I think that that's a really important thing about the Bay Area. It's yeah. always been like that. Um, can you tell me a little, about, a little bit about Chaos Butterfly, that project? Chaos Butterfly was an interesting thing. It developed uh, out of... Um, studying electronic music a lot mm -hmm. and all, and the improv world and I got together with Dina Emerson who was singing for Cirque du Soleil 
cool. And she plays wine glasses and um, sings. And I was using two computers. She was using a computer. Um, and I played violin and guitar. And she sang and played wine glasses. And we tried to start from an improvisational bass and tried to make songs. And it was it was pretty tough actually trying to make songs, but we we managed to do it on a few of those records. And we have a there's an also a really nice recording from uh, Sweden from Gothenburg um, with Biggie Vinkola who plays saxophone and flute uh, that we that we did that was entirely improvised in the studio with a small audience of about 25 people. Cool. I think that's one of the one of the best Chaos Butterfly examples. Yeah. Is that that project still active? No, right. Dina moved back to Las Vegas. Okay. Um, she was initially uh, singing as a sub in. I can't remember. O, oh, and now she's in Mystere full time. Mm. So she's moved back to Las Vegas. So I, Chaos Butterfly now exists as me and whomever I get to perform with. Lately, I've done with John Haynes, who's normally a drummer who plays with me on my rock records, but he also mm. plays uh, computer and stuff like that. So I've done a lot of stuff as Chaos Butterfly with him. Um, you've also done music for dance. Can you speak, yes. to, speak to some of that? That's what I love directory. doing music for dance companies. I've worked yeah. with a lot of Bay Area dance companies, um, primarily Sid Perlman, whom I met at Zeitgeist when I was bartending there in the early 90s. Um, she, she said, I'd worked with some other dance companies previous to that. And she came up and she said, Hey, I hear you're a musician. I run a dance company. I need a musician. And I said, I could do that. That was about 1992. And I've been doing music for her ever since. Um, I've done a lot of music for Sid Perlman as nesting dolls when they were here in San Francisco and, and here. And we've worked in two different ways. Sometimes she'll just give me a graph of the dance. You know, this part's big, this part's small. Sometimes she'll just say, it's this long. And then, oh, no, this needs to be edited. I need parts of three minutes, two minutes, and then three minutes, that sort of stuff. Yeah. But it's a great experience, very different from, I mean, it's very visceral and very different from writing uh, uh, rock music. I've also done uh, music for Ellie Leonhardt, Kurt Hayworth, who are East Coast choreographers, and uh, uh, Deborah Slater's dance company here. Um, and I performed with Deborah Slater for a couple of uh, different shows here where I was actually on stage in costume and I even had to actually dance. Oh, nice. Them, which was a little <laughs> tough, but um, it's fun. I Helps really you understand like... what you're you know, yeah. creating for, too. Yeah, exactly. Um, I played one of the Deborah Slater concerts um, were over at uh, that place at 9th and Mission, um, Counterpulse. Mm -hmm. I was playing slide guitar with the dance company and then afterwards realized that Bonnie Raitt had been in the audience. Oh my Very God. embarrassing. <laughs> um, but... Uh, it's fun. I really love doing music for dance. Music yeah. for dance is really amazing. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so my last question, you yeah. clearly draw on so many different influences, a huge palette. What are some of the things you're listening to now? Um, strangely, I was just listening to this uh, psychedelic blues rock playlist from Wolfgang's Vault. Nice. Uh, yeah. A nice two hours of late 60s uh, psychedelic blues rock. I'm still into it. Yeah. What can I say? Well, it's all coming back to, I know, you know and it's, it, but it's so, it's so amazing. And it, like some of those guys, I uh, never fail to be amazed at how good a musician some of these guys that were like in their twenties were in the sixties. How did they do it? I mean, who, who, what San Francisco kid in his twenties now can they play guitar? They were groundbreaking. Yeah. And like that, you know, I mean, it's like, okay, you guys have pedals that can make you sound like Jimi Hendrix, but you can't play like that. I'm sorry. It's going to take another 15 years of playing. I mean, it's taken me years of playing guitar to be able to get any good at all. And I'm, you know, violin, I thought, yeah, by the time I'm 50, I'll maybe be able to play the violin. I don't know if that's going to work out either, <laughs> but, um, let's see what else. Um, uh, I just was in Chicago with camper and went to the rock and jazz blues store there, the record store, and got some very odd records um, and some outside records. I got a Music Electronica Viva record, Improv Noise, from the late 60s, uh, Robert Ashley Opera. Um, um, yeah, and you'd have some interesting picks to tell us. <laughs> yeah, uh, I wish I'd been prepared. I could have actually thought about no, it a little are, more. I mean, great. Um, let's see. Oh, I was just listening to Arvo Pert last night for a long time. Uh, my wife works at a Scandinavian school here in San Francisco where they only speak Swedish and Danish and Norwegian to the kids. And she wanted some sad music that they could paint to. Aww. She's like, what do we got that's, that was good? And I was like, oh, there's some Marvel parrot we could put on. And then uh, that Japanese band Mono mm -hmm. uh, with World's End Girlfriend, they made a, um, a record which is incredible, just incredible. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, beautiful stuff. Beautiful instrumental music. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for stopping sure. by and playing such a beautiful session. Love to be and, here. And uh, yeah, come back again anytime. Sure. Bye-bye. Sure.